In this video, we're going to talk about fitting more complex models. And by complex, I mean um, allowing for transformations of predictors um, or interaction terms in our model. And so this might be important just because when we're using a, an iterative selection process like the step function, um, we might want to consider that option. We might want to consider having a polynomial term or a log transformation of a predictor or a interaction um, as well. And so we can kind of code that into our selection process if we wish to. So as a reminder, um, interactions are when um, um, two predictors, or, or more, I guess we can have a, a three-way interaction as well, um, but a two-way interaction is you know, more common to model, is when um, the effect of this predictor on the response depends on the value of another predictor. And so there may be value to uh, modeling that um, interaction in the model. And so we can easily code in interaction terms with this, um, with this exponent 2 notation, um, or you know, exponent 3 if we want to allow for three-way interactions as well. Um, so we'll see an example of that on uh, one of these next slides. Um, logs and polynomial terms we can also add as well um, by just coding that in, log of predictor or i of predictor squared or cubed or whatever as well. Um, and so we can just include that into our uh, model equation as well. And we usually um, find need for these kind of predictor transformations if we look at the simple scatter plot of that predictor against the response. And if we see um, that the relationship does not appear linear, maybe it has more of a curve, maybe, um, maybe the variance is very non-constant or the residuals are very non-normal, that might be a case where we consider a log transformation as maybe giving us a little bit more predictive power in understanding that relationship. So interaction terms, um, here's an example where I am building a model where I am going to look at all two-way interactions of these four predictors. So by adding this um, square term at the end, what I'm telling R to do is P1 times P2 plus P1 times P3 plus P1 times P4 plus P2 times P4, and you probably get the idea. I think I just skipped three here, so that should be three, um, plus P3 times P4. So those would be all the different two-way interactions that I could create from these four predictors. Um, so this is kind of a nice shorthand um, that I can use, especially if I'm gonna use like a stepwise selection method. Maybe I wanna consider all the different two-way interactions. I can do that very quickly with that notation. If I don't wanna include all the predictors as possibilities, and I can just kind of separate them out like this. So maybe maybe I, for whatever reason, don't want to look for that option of P5 or P6 involved in a two-way interaction. Well, I can just put them out here then. If I want to save some time, I don't want to actually write out all the variables, um, but I want to include all variables in this particular data frame, um, then I can just do dot and then square that dot. So again, dot represents um, all predictors or all remaining variables. And so to do dot squared means to look at all two-way interactions possible of all the remaining variables that I'm including here. And when I do that, by the way, um, it is still going to model the simple relationships as well. So I guess maybe I should add up here, um, there's still gonna be P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 plus all these other terms as well. So the simple relationships in addition to the two-way interactions are all going to be included when I do that. If I want to include a log or a polynomial of a predictor, I can do that as well. I can even code that into the interactions. Um, so, so if I want the log of P1 as my, represent, as my representation of the P1 predictor, I can do that, and I can even include that in my two-way interaction possibilities. I could even do that with a polynomial term. I could include a polynomial term inside as well. I just did an example where I didn't do that um, to show that it did, I can do it either way. Um, but yeah, I can um, also code in a um, transformation of a squared predictor as well into this. And so this is really helpful because if I'm doing stepwise selection, um, you know, maybe I want to include those options. Um, 
So then I can create this model however I want. Um, I can even um, uh, transform the response variable in this model before plugging it into the stepwise function as well. Um, so, so you can keep these options open. One more thing that I do want to mention while I'm here, and I'll mention this again in a later video, and that is um, when you do the stepwise function in R, it's going to actually show you every iterative process of the fitting. And if you have a lot of um, parameters, that's going to get really time consuming. It's going to be a really, really long list of stuff. So if you add in this argument trace equals zero, it's only going to show you the end result, which can be really helpful and save you a lot of time if you have a really long model that it's looking at, because otherwise you might end up sitting there for a really long time waiting for it to finish. All right, just a quick refresh here. Um, when do we do a log transformation on a predictor? Um, there's a couple examples where this might make sense to do. Um, the first is contextually, if it just makes sense with the particular variable that we're looking at. So oftentimes, um, if we have a variable that is in exponential form, um, so oftentimes variables that represent a percentage or ratio with respect to another variable, um, it might make sense to do this. So one example is when I have a variable that represents um, the, the risk or the percentage relative to something else, then the scale from zero to one is equivalent to the scale from one to infinity. And so what I get is a highly exponential variable where the distance from you know, 0.5 to 0.8 is not the same distance as 1.4 to 1.7. They're, they're extremely different ranges. Um, so whenever I have a predictor like that, it might contextually make sense to do a log transformation. Um, in addition to con context, I can also just kind of look at the residual plot and I can notice um, that the residuals are not normally distributed or the variance is non-constant for y given x. And those might be cases where log transformation just gives me better predictive power. It helps me better um, model that relationship um, appropriately. Um, so, so if I have a scatter plot that looks like this, or maybe it's kind of like there's a lot of data clustered here. And then there's also just kind of this like, you know, non-normal residuals where I'm getting these like really high uh, residuals once in a while, even though the relationship's really down kind of here. Um, this might be a case where a log transformation improves that, that fitting process between the two variables where a log transformation of the predictor then um, becomes a much better fitting predictor for that model. We might also consider that if we just have non-constant variance. So again, if I just kind of have something that looks like this, um, again, a log transformation might be appropriate for improving that predictive power. Um, I think log transformations, if I remember correctly, only really work if we're working with positive variables. So if, so if that particular variable also includes negative values, um, you, you might have to um, add a constant to that. So you might have to do the log of x plus some value such that the values then are all positive. Um, but a lot of the time we, we don't work with variables that are both positive and negative. Um, Sometimes we do, um, many times they're just positive, um, but just kind of keep that in mind that if your log transformation doesn't work, it might be because that particular variable includes negative values as well. And if you wanna do a log transformation, you're gonna to have to add a constant to thus make those values all positive, or at least all above zero. All right, um, so that's a log transformation option. Uh, we might also choose a polynomial as well. Um, so a polynomial is going to be best if the relationship I see is just not strictly linear. Um, so for example, if I see a relationship that looks kind of like this, this is not um, strictly linear, and maybe I have a little bit more noise. Let me just add a little bit more kind of uncertainty there to make it more realistic. Um, you know, a, a linear fit is not terrible. I mean, I could, I could certainly kind of do this. But we might also kind of realize that some kind of, um, you know, at least a quartic term probably fits this data a little bit better. 
where I have that ability to kind of curve the relationship a little bit more. Um, and so this is, a polynomial is going to make a lot of sense when this happens. Um, if my variance is non-constant in addition to the fit just being non-linear, then a log transformation might be another option I consider. Um, but as long as the variance is not terribly non-constant and I have this kind of curved fit, then a polynomial is probably sufficient um, as the, the uh, transformation of choice here. Uh, I think I have, did I do, yeah, so this is kind of redundant here on the bottom because I put this on a different slide as well. Um, but just kind of a reminder about response variable transformations because you might be wondering, well, when do I do predictor transformations versus just transforming the response variable? Um, and so transforming the response is usually something I do if I'm trying to improve my um, diagnostics at the end. So, so this response transformation might help me um, get normally distributed residuals with constant variance. And so a log transformation on the response is a very common transformation to do in that context, or maybe just using box cox as a generic kind of approach, where maybe it's not a log transformation, but maybe it's some other um, exponential um, transformation that, that can make that happen. Um, but I do, do kind of want to mention here um, that uh, number one, Transforming the response does make the model a little bit harder to understand, um, so it does kind of hurt the interpretability. If your goal is primarily prediction, then maybe it's fine, um, but if your goal is to keep your model simple and to make it easily understandable and how these variables relate, then maybe this is not a big priority um, to do this. Um, the reason that we value having normal residuals and constant variance is for purpose of both statistical power in um, estimating the parameters, as well as being able to use something like a prediction interval, uh, because prediction intervals in, um, assume normality of y given a particular set of predictor values. Um, so if we want to, to be able to make those assumptions, um, then this is helpful, um, but they're not necessarily priorities. Like it's not necessarily wrong or bad if these things aren't true. Um, so, um, and it's also just kind of nice to have if you think about prediction, right? So if I, if I think about my residuals and my residuals look like, um, so maybe this is my horizontal residuals equals zero. You know, if my, oops, um, if my residuals kind of look like this, that means that my prediction is a lot worse in some places than it is in others. And maybe I would like to create a model where my predictions are equally um, reliable regardless of what my input values are. Um, so, so that would be helpful as well. Um, as well, and for the same reason, having non-normal residuals kind of hurts that as well because it means every once in a while I get really off in my predictions. Um, so having a log transformation or something like that on the response can improve that reliability in prediction. Uh, but again, if, you're, if you value interpretability a little bit more, there's nothing wrong with um, leaving out that transformation at the end if you're okay with that and you understand um, that limitation of your model and that kind of unreliability of prediction that you might be okay with at that cost of simplicity.